So there are two tests that we want to run when we typically set up uh, new accounts. And these are two things that work with our peripherals, the PCI cable, and also in some cases when you're using the USB port, you may have to reassign your COM ports. So I'm going to show you how to do both of those. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to have an account open. We're going to take our PCI cable, we're going to plug it into our USB port. And the reason we're going to do this is we need to make sure that we're getting communication uh, through the USB port so that we can communicate to our data transfer module which will allow us to take that unit to the door to do programming. So let's run the test. Right up here in the toolbars, we're going to come up here to tools, come down here to COM port setup and test. We're going to run test and what we're looking for is a loop back pass COM port set to COM port 2 we know that we have communication set. If that does not appear and you have invalid port or port already open, what you would do is minimize this screen here. We're going to go down to the start button. We're going to go find our control panel. And we're going to look for system. We're going to double click. And here we're going to look for hardware. Device manager. Let's go ahead and open up the screen so we can see it. And what we're looking for is these ports right here. And when we right click on this, we're going to get a pop-up window and we're going to choose properties. From here, we're going to choose port settings. Come down here to advanced. And what we're looking for is to see what COM ports are not currently in use. And you can see that COM ports 2, 3, or 3, 4, 5, and 6 are in use. We're not going to use those. We want to use COM port 2. We set OK. Hit OK. Go ahead and close out this screen. Close out this screen. Go ahead and close down here. Now we're ready to go. So one of the things that I'd like to make sure that everyone is aware of when they purchase the communication cable, we call this an ALPCI2U, U standing that is going to connect through the USB port. It comes as a complete unit. When you purchase the unit from your distributor, it's going to come in a package like this. One of the things I'd like to make sure you're aware of is that there's actually a mini disc inside the cardboard header. And what happens sometimes is people will toss the header into the trash not realizing that this disk is inside there. Should that happen, we've located the disk in three other locations for you. Obviously, you have the disk that came with the package, but we also include it in with your software download. You also can get it on the website when you download our software. So there's no charge, so don't fret if for some reason you threw, out, threw it out, it's there, okay? All right, so from here, what we'd like to be able to do is we'd like to discuss how we're going to set up a basic system. Think of a master key system. And I realize that uh, as a locksmith myself, one of the things that when you do when you set up a master key system is you think about all of the things that that end user and the employees are going to need to go, the access. So one of the things that we do is we want to make sure that when we set up a master key or we set up the deal window system, kind of think of that in, in your mind frame is that set up as a master key system. It's a very simple process. All we're going to do here is we're going to go back to the computer we're going to right click into the white area here and we're going to get a pop-up. The pop-up is going to give us some options. Here we're going to choose new account. So when we left click here, this is going to be the name of the customer that you're working with. So let's say for example, we're working with um, a realty company. We would just simply type in the name of the company there and we hit OK. From here it's going to ask you if you'd like to create new lock profiles. These are the locations of the locks that you're going to install. So it's very important to think about ahead of time where the locks and what type of locks that you're going to install. So we're going to go ahead and hit yes. And from here we're going to get another pop-up. And that pop-up is going to ask us what is the description or location of the first lock. Let's just, for example, call it the front door. That's where it's going to be installed. What's very important here is choosing the correct model type. The model type is what's printed on your box. It's our part number. So one of the samples that we're going to be using today is we have what we call a mortise lock, prox lock mortise lock, so PDL 3500. We're going to choose that. It's going to ask us to create one lock or we can create multiple locks. And there's two schools of thought there. If we create one lock, which is what I always prefer to do and how we teach, is that you create one lock, you create a template. You put all of the information inside that template and then what you're able to do from that point is you're able to clone it. Now, cloning the lock means that you're able to save a, a tremendous amount of work and stops because you're taking all of the information from your template or your first lock and you're going to copy it and create subsequent locks. So let's do that. Simply hit OK and from here we're going to get the 
global user screen. The global user screen, you can think of it as the database, or in some terms, a file cabinet. The thing that you'll notice here is it's broken into basically three sections. We have the usernames. This is the list of people or employees. This is where we're actually going to enter the information into this area here. And from here, what you'll be able to see is that we have the ability to put up to 2,000 locks. Now, don't get dizzy when I do this. There you go. So you got 2,000 locks. What you'll notice is that one lock is available for us right now. You can see that it's not grayed out. So the first thing we have to do is we've got to do a little bit of housekeeping. We want to come down here to the admin screen. Now, the admin screen is where we're going to keep the master code, the manager code, the supervisor codes, also where we have programming user codes, such as the data transfer module, the PC upload download code, etc. So let's go ahead and do that. From here, you'll notice that the master code is preset to our factory default. For training purposes, let's go ahead and change that. And obviously, you always want to change your master code, and it must always be six digits. Let's change that to factory code backwards, 654321, very simple. Here, we're going to be using standalone locks, and keep in mind, the first part of this uh, segment is going to be talking about our standalone locks, the T3 series. We're going to use a data transfer module, there we go. Once we're there, we can, inst we can uh, add installers, managers, supervisors. For this exercise here, we're going to skip that part, we're going to come down to accept. By doing that and hitting accept, what happens, every lock I make from this point forward, all of the information in the admin screen will be automatically populated in every lock that I make. Even if I make changes with an existing system, it will go back and backfill all of that information. From here, what we have to think about is how are we going to add users? Now, we can come over here and we can type in names one at a time. Let's type in Heather. She's attending our class today. And from here, we have a choice. We can do a two-digit, a three-digit code, a four-digit code, a five or a six. Let's just make it a two-digit code. It's very simple. And from here, we can just simply double-click on the lock screen. Now, the way I look at things is green means go. If I was to double-click it again, it turns it red. Red means stop. What that means is that if Heather tries to get into the front door, we're going we're gonna to realize that she attempted it. We're going to get a denied access. This is a terrific tool for when you're uh, um, terminating employees. What happens is if they come in after hours, you're going to get a denied access. You're going to see that someone came in. I mean, if Heather's roaming around the building and it's 2 o'clock on a Saturday morning, you go up there and say, hey, Heather, what are you doing? So from here, let's go ahead and turn her back. White means that she's not in the lock. From here, she's green. From that point forward, I can simply type in two or 300 names. The problem is this. If I have two or 300 names, time is money. I don't want to have to sit here and do that one at a time. So we have some tools to help you. One of the things that we have is what we call a C, uh, importing a CSV file. You can go to the HR department, have them drop it into an Excel spreadsheet. I'll show you how to do that. We're going to come up here to Tools, Import CSV File from Excel, and this screen here is going to show you what it is that you need to give the HR department. And basically in an Excel spreadsheet it sells. You're going to use cell A1 as the first name, cell B1 as the last name, and if you care to add any other additional information, you can do that. Now, I have one already set up. Let me show you what it looks like. Here it is. Cell 1, A1 is Bob, last name Swope. A2 is Scott, B2 is Shram, etc. Okay? So let's just cancel that. That's done. Save it in our export folder. Save. Okay, we're back here again. We're just simply going to say yes, and from here we're going to go to our export folder in our DO Windows file on our hard drive, and we're going to find our name list. And you can call it anything you want. You can simply call it name list. You can call it the company name. Once we do that, we're going to double click. We're going to get another pop-up that says your import completed without errors. And look at that. So now what happens is I'm easily able to, in a few seconds, add users to the database. From here I have a couple of choices. You can see that we've already added, added Heather. We've got other people in here, and if you look over here on the screen, you'll notice that they're blank in the lock, meaning that they're not in the lock whatsoever. Again, I can come up here, double click, and what does it tell me? The thing about the software is if you make an error or you make a mistake, the software will bring up a window that tells you what you forgot to do. I forgot to add a prox card or to um, add a PIN code. Let's add a PIN code, 333. Now, I could do this one at a time, and i got 50 names here that's going to take a little bit of time to do that. So let's do it a different way. 
Well, let's go ahead, and this is just simply a, a process of, uh, of Microsoft, is we're going to highlight the very first name. I'm going to hold down the shift key. I'm going to come down and scroll to the last name in my list. Because what I want to do is I'm going to have the software generate randomly my code numbers for me. Now what happens is when I release the shift key, I have all of these names highlighted. I'm simply going to make sure my mouse is in this blue area. I'm going to right click and I have a pop-up. You're going to see this pop-up several times today during the training session. We're going to select generate new selected codes, meaning it's who, what I have highlighted. Let's go ahead and choose that. You sure you want to do this? Yes. Now, it's going to ask me if I want a code length of four, five, or six digits. Let's choose four. It's easy to remember. Boom. There we go. So now what happens is we've easily, in a matter of seconds, added 45, 50 names. Could be several hundred. And we've chosen, randomly selected by the computer, four-digit codes. From here, I have some choices. And again, what we talked about earlier was creating one lock as a template, using that lock as the template so that we can create additional locks. You may have a 10-door system maybe a 100-door system. So in review, we've added users, we've auto-generated codes, we've set up our admin screen. What I want to show you how to do now is how to add HID cards. So the cards that we read would be the standard card format that HID has called 120 kilohertz. I've got an example of three different types of cards that uh, are pretty common. Key fob goes on your key ring. This is typically a credential or badge. Maybe it goes on your um, your lanyard around your neck or on your belt and then this is a unique product here called a microprox tag what's nice about this is that if you have a different technology card you actually self-adhesive will go on to an existing card another idea is to put it on the back of your driver's license now your picture ID already one of the things to keep in mind is since we read all formats from 26 to 48 bit of the 125k HID card if you come across an existing end user that already has an access control system in place, you're able to take our Trilogy locks, install them on offline doors such as IT rooms, executive offices, labs, and you can actually take their cards and enroll them into our software. Let me show you how to do that. So if we take one of these existing cards here, let's use the key fob for example. All we have to do in the software is we're going to highlight the person that we want to enroll. From here, we're going to come down here to the button that says Add Cards. Choose the button. Make sure that our enroller is on. And one of the things that's important here is we read all of these different types of card formats. Continental, DSX, HID 37-bit. Uh, the 35-bit, by the way, is the Corporate 1000 card, so keep that in mind. Plus we have proprietary cards. Alarm Lock's parent company is NAPCO. So our car card format is NAP 36-bit. It's a proprietary card, so let's choose that. And if I want to use the enroller, the thing that's important here is to make sure that I enable the enroller by the check mark. What I want to be able to do is just take the card, I'm going to place it on the reader, and what you'll see here is two things happen. First of all, my name in the user list becomes highlighted in a light yellow. That's a visual indicator that I have a prox card attached. Secondly, what you'll notice down here in the prox card data is that it shows me the prox card information. NAPCO 36-bit, it's got a facility code of 19, and what you'll notice is an e-jet number on this uh, key fob. If I'm going to add one more person in here, let's add Heather, for example, and use the card, is the same thing. We're going to come up to Heather, we're going to highlight Heather's name, come down here to add cards. This time what I want to be able to do is I want to be able to add cards without using the reader. And what's nice about this is if I have three pieces of information, obviously I know what the bit type is, I know what the facility code is, and I know what the inkjet number in the card is. I can actually keystroke that information in, which means that I don't have to retrieve the card first. So let's do that. If I come up here to card number, I'm just reading the inkjet number on it, 544184. I know it's facility code 19, hit 19, and from here I'm just simply going to hit the button here that's called build card data, and there we go. Now what you'll notice is Heather's highlighted. You'll see that the card information in this area here shows this information here and it matches up. From there we simply need to add these users to the locks, and again we can do this a couple different ways. We can come up to Bob and I can highlight green for the front door back door, same thing. Or secondly, what we're able to do is the same thing. As I come down here to Heather, hold my shift key, 
go to the last name in the list, highlight everything in between, right click. Remember, all of our shortcuts are attached to the right mouse key. Same pop-up that you've seen previously, and here we have choices. Add selected users to a lock or all locks. In this case, let's just simply add them to all locks. It's going to reconfirm, do you want to do this? Yes. And there we go. What happens is if you pick out an individual person, say Dave Sheffy here, you'll notice Dave's green in both locks. If I go down to David Smith, same thing, green in both locks. Once we get this set up, what we're able to do is we can edit. We can come here and say, you know, with David Smith, I don't want him to be able to have access to the front door. I want him to go through the back door. Same thing with Keith. I want him to go through the front door, but not the back door. Simply turning a user red in the lock screen means that the lock will accept that he is in the system, but he's going to deny access. So when I run an audit trail, I'm going to get Keith, Heather, Dave denied access. And that's really important, especially in a termination case if someone tries to come back in. Okay, so one of the things that I mentioned earlier is the fact that the DTM3 can be configured or programmed as a DTM2, which is used with version 3.0.4 or a DTM3 which is used with versions 3.6.3 or higher. Let me show you how to do this and how you determine if it's in a 2 or a 3 is simply how many screens that you can see that are different. So for example if you're looking at the screen now it's saying DTM3 plug in waiting for lock. If I press the button again which is the green button I'm going to get PC COM mode. So PC COM mode means when I'm connected to the computer. If I press the button again it's going to say plug in interlocked. This is DTM2 mode. This has to be reconfigured as a DTM3, and it's a very simple process. I'm going to press and hold the two outside buttons, and I'm going to press and hold what seems for a long time, and what I'm waiting for it to do is to get into a program mode. And sometimes what, has, what you have to do is you have to press, release, press again until it catches so that it can be re reprogrammed. And you're going to hear a tone. It's going to give you the version number. And what's going to happen is it's going to go into a config test mode. And it's going to tell you to continue holding. Once it says entering, you can release the two buttons. We do two things, and it's always with the green button. Is we're going to hold the green button to run a test, or we're going to press and release to skip a test. We don't need to configure language. It's by default English, press and release. Okay, we're going to configure for DTM3. This is the test we need to run. So what we need to do is we need to press and hold until it goes into the DTM3 config. We can release. Now it's going to give you choices. DTM3 config mode, uh, no, off, or exit. Or I'm sorry, on, off, and exit. Reading it upside down. Let's press on. Exit. Okay, task is ending. Door select mode. Remember when we use the data transfer module, when we first initialize a lock, we have to take and send an encryption key of the door address from the software into the lock. So we have to make sure we have the ability to be into the door select mode. So we're going to run the test, press and hold. Okay. It's going to ask you on, off, or exit. Let's run it on, exit. Okay, task is ending. The next few tasks we can simply skip. Skip. Beeper test, skip, 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 skip. Sleep down, then power down. So let's run that test. And it's going to come back up. Okay, it's going to sleep down for five seconds. Okay, now we're set. So what we have to do now is we have to turn it back on. It's going to give you the version number, checking memory. And the next step is extremely important because the next step is going to determine if you've configured it as a DTM2 or DTM3. And you have two modes of operation, select and standard. We want this to be in door select mode, so the proper choice is select. Now, when I hit the green button, you'll notice there are three modes, PC COM mode, lock mode, and door select mode. So that's how you su successfully configure the DTM from a 2, 2, or 3, or vice versa. Hopefully this section has helped.